Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Astronomy 100. Today is September 7th. Hopefully, you guys have had a good uh, weekend with this long extended weekend. And uh, we're resuming, of course, our concepts. There were assignments that are uh, on this week also. So we really have to take care of them. There is a message that I sent earlier. I don't know if I did send, did I send it today or it's scheduled for some other time. Just looking at the messages. Yes, it's, uh, I sent it already. It's, uh, it says you should have received it at 7.30 in the morning and it's concerning a, a, a special meeting this Thursday at 9 a.m. And that meeting is basically optional. Uh, if you don't really have a problem with Stellarium, but if you have issues or things are not clear or things like that, yeah, actually you're urged to attend it. There will be no assignment for that meeting on Thursday. Uh, it's planned for two hours, but it could last a lot less than that, depending on how it goes with you guys. So basically we're going to go through the entire process for Stellarium. I may even have to go through the installation process to make sure that everything is, uh, is, uh, is working. And I will also go through the different versions of Stellarium, especially the web version, see how that works. And uh, so that is one thing that uh, we're doing this week. Hopefully you guys will uh, do not have problems with Stellarium, but if you do, it's a good idea to uh, come on uh, Thursday and uh, join us. Now this session is open for a lot of other groups, so uh, it's fine if uh, basically uh, you join later for it. The point is you can watch it recorded later on. So again, it's an open session that is, uh, uh, that is not required, but uh, actually optional. Optional that is if you don't have a problem with the software. Now the invitation, the actual invitation with the link into uh, into uh, the, the the Zoom session, you're going to receive it on Thursday at eight o'clock in the morning, because out of experience in the past, that uh, when I send an invitation well ahead of time, uh, people tend to uh, not find it. I mean, a lot of people uh, because it gets buried down in the uh, in the in the emails that you receive. So you, you will not, you have difficulty finding it, at least a lot of you do, not everybody. The point is, so on Thursday morning, around eight o'clock in the morning, you should receive the link to the Zoom session. And the Zoom session itself starts at 9 a.m., okay? And uh, hopefully I will see you there for it so that we, because the activity I did in week two, which was optional actually at this point, because we're still getting to you to know the software, is uh, some of you expressed concern about the fact that you use a lot of uh, shortcuts and how we can overcome the shortcuts or what are the alternatives to the shortcuts, okay? So that is basically the idea behind it, okay? So uh, again, uh, that is for the message that you received at 7.30 in the morning. Today's week is focused on one of the key concepts that you're going to learn in this class. Okay. It is Kepler's loss. So uh, Kepler's laws by far are, uh, first of all, they were discovered in uh, the 1600s. And by far, they are they, uh, initially they were discovered for the solar system. Okay, that's how Kepler actually expressed them for the planets revolving around the sun. And these three laws, which are part of the assignment today in the discussion, are really uh, the focus of a lot of things we do in this class. Toward just before when Kepler actually died, the lift before him, when he passed away in the 1650s, uh, six, uh, 1660s when uh, Kepler uh, passed away. So around that time basically is when uh, when Newton formulated his law of universal gravitation. And he extended those laws, not just for the solar system, but for any uh, stellar object out there. Basically they govern the universe. That's how we think about them. We will see down the road that there are exceptions to these laws near large bodies, especially Newton's uh, interpretations of this loss near la large bodies, where, uh, where this loss start to fail, OK? 
okay? And then Einstein's uh, rules basically take over to explain what's going on. So this is basically one of the key concepts that's gonna be learning in this class. For sure, you will have a homework assignment. For sure, you will have quizzes on it. For sure, you will be tested on it. So it is important that we know these three laws, all of them, okay? Albeit when Kepler formulated them, they did not have a lot of math, if you wish. They do, okay, but not as much, okay? Not a lot of calculations, if you wish. There is uh, no assignment that I that is due today, but there will be assignment that will be coming from the discussion today. The item of the discussion today is for Kepler's laws. Okay, I did not I did not state the prompt yet. Okay, I'm coming down to it. I'm just trying to formulate it, and you will have. It. Sounds good, Daniel. Okay. No problem. Uh, okay, so the thing with it is, these three laws. I'm just trying to build up basically the 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the how important they are. I'm trying to uh, basically instill in you on how important they are. Obviously, Newton's formulation or Newton's interpretation later on uh, uh, is is uh, is uh, is. Uh, is what carries more calculations in it. So in other words, there will be an assignment today, discussion item today on Kepler's laws, okay? There will be homework assignments on Kepler's laws. There will be quizzes on Kepler's laws. There will be questions in the exams on Kepler's laws. So this is important, okay? So we have to understand what they are and how they are used and so on and so forth, okay? Let me put it in a different perspective to understand how important these things are. They're really, or at least the work that came after them, the foundation of a lot of things that happened in science. A lot of modern science and technology that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, they started from those simple questions that we started to, uh, to ask as a human species, basically. It started with the work of Copernicus before Kepler. And when Copernicus basically looked at the skies, he was asked actually to recalculate or to fix the calendar by the church. And in doing so, he first of all abandoned the geocentric model, namely that the earth is not the center of the solar system. The sun does not revolve around the earth. The, the moon does. Okay. but the sun does not. M Mars does not revolve around the earth. There is a nice video I posted for you guys in the review in the week review. Hopefully you guys will go through it. It's a very short video, about two, three minutes so that you guys can go and see the how the Ptolemaic model or the geocentric model can interpret but falls short of the interpretation of the different phases of, 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 uh, of uh, Venus, okay? But a more accurate description is that of, of, of uh, the heliocentric model, where the sun is the center of the solar system. And that is what Copernicus actually basically uh, 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 found himself in. He said, okay, abandon, the earth is not the center of the solar system, the sun is. Okay, and things started to improve from that point. Tycho Brahe came on later on, he was a Danish astronomer. He built an observatory actually in an island near Denmark and he started collecting data. And data he has collected a lot of data, okay? For the different planets, Mars especially, uh, Venus, uh, Jupiter, uh, Mercury, all kinds of data he has in his, in, in he collected that, okay? The observatory did not have a telescope as we know them today, but it was, it was really a lot of nights he spent them there on that island collecting data. And he collected the wealth data and he was really, really, really protective of that data. And he thought that it's very, very valuable. He had some ideas about the solar system himself. So he brought in a mathematician at that time, Kepler, to help him explain what's going on. So Mr. Kepler, in looking at those data, 
he came up with the three laws. First of all, the two laws were very easy. He came up with them very fast. And the, the, the first law, this is basically my interpretation of it, is that the sun sits in one focal point of an ellipse. This is an ellipse, not a circle, actually. It, the characteristic of the, uh, the, the ellipse, it has two focal points, okay? The circle has only one center point, which means that for an ellipse, for a circle, you take the two focal points and you put them in the center. So the, in a sense, the circle is a special case of an ellipse. So an ellipse is a more general case than a circle. The only difference is that for the circle, it's an ellipse with where the two focal points coincide on one another, okay? The ellipse has two focal points. It has this distance from edge to edge, from here to here. It's called the, uh, the major axis, half of which is called the semi-major axis, okay? This distance as opposed from here to here, from top to bottom, that is actually the minor axis, okay? And half of that distance from the center of the symmetry, this is not a circle, by the way, the center of the shape to the top or to the bottom is called the semi-minor axis, okay? So these are some of the properties of the ellipse. So this is geometry. The ellipse, if you take a cone, ice cream cone, for example, and you take the cone shaped like this and you cut it right parallel to the base. That is actually a circle. If you cut it, cut it at an angle, at a slanted angle, doesn't matter which direction, this way or the other, that is actually what an ellipse is. If you cut it in such a way at, uh, from the top to the bottom, in this case, of course, you're gonna cross some of the edges in there. You're gonna produce another conic shape called the uh, the uh, parabola. And if you cut it in a speck, cut it in a special coming from the edge down to the base, then in this case, you come up with another conic shape, hyperbola. So all of these shapes, whether the circle, the, the ellipse, the parabola, or the hyperbola, there are all four of these shapes, all four of these shapes. The line is a special case, if you wish, where you cut right at the edge, okay? So the line also, you can approximate it to one of the conic shapes. So again, these are the conic shapes. It turns out the ellipse is actually where the planets move around the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sun. They go on this path. Okay, so what is an ellipse? This distance from here to one of the focal points added to the other one. Let's say I take this point. From this point to one of the focal points plus the distance to the other focal point is the same on any points on this shape. It's the same everywhere, okay? So that is really what an ellipse is. A similar in a sense to the circle, except the circle is the distance from any point on the circle to the center is the same. The ellipse is not one point, it's two points. So the distance from that point on the ellipse to, any, to the two points, when you add them up, it's the same fixed number. That's why to build this ellipse, if we're in class, I will, I will build one, it's easy to do. Take a string, okay? And you wrap a loose string, not, not a, not a, uh, not tight, okay? Loose one. And you wrap it around, of course, you wrap, you have to tie it, and you wrap it around, and you take a pen or a pencil, and you run it through, okay? Because the string does not stretch, in this case, you are making sure the distance is the same from the two focal points, it doesn't change. So that is what an ellipse is, and that is what the first law of Kepler is. So the first law is the planets, as they revolve around the sun, where the sun sits in one of the focal points. In this figure, it's exaggerated big time. I made sure that the two focal points are well separated. In actuality, because of the size of the sun, these two focal points are actually very close. They're actually inside the sun, okay? But they are different. They are not the same. 
Had they been the same, it becomes a circle again. Okay. How flat is the ellipse? In other words, how big the separation and how close from each other is another property also of the ellipse called the eccentricity of the, of the, of the ellipse. If you take a circle and you bring these two points right in the middle, then in this case, you end up with an eccentricity of zero because there is no separation between them. So that is the, the, you can call the circle then in this case an ellipse with zero eccentricity because it's symmetrical. It's not flat at all. It's the same every which way we look at it. But an ellipse has definitely a bulge on one side and flat on the other. It's eccentric. And the measure of that is basically related to how far these two focal points are. Because of the fact that most of the, for most of the planets, the eccentricity is practically zero, their orbits are very close from circular paths, but they are not exactly circles. That's why Mr. Copernicus was not really alarmed when he said that they are still circles. That's why we thought everything is circular, because they are very close from circles, but they are not exactly circles. Okay. Now, there are exceptions to that. For the outer bodies, for example, for Pluto, it's clearly very eccentric compared to the rest of the planets. Mars actually is also has a high eccentricity compared to the other planets. So the eccentricity is relative from planet to planet, albeit for most of them, at least, it's very close from a circle, but it is not, which means that the two focal points, they're for the most part inside the sun, okay? the sun, they're very close from each other. They're not the same. If they are the same, they are exactly eccentricity of zero, but they are slightly separated. So this is the first law of Kepler. The first law of Kepler is that the planets, when they go around the sun, they go in elliptical paths, just like this path I showed you, okay? And uh, they do so in such a way that the sun sits in one of the focal points, albeit with different eccentricities, with different flat, basically, ellipses, but they are still ellipses nonetheless. So this is one of the corrections that Mr. Kepler has made to the work of uh, Copernicus based on the data of Tycho Brahe. So let me share with you the screen so that we know what the objectives of this class is. Let me share. So this is the only unit this week is this unit, unit 12. You see what happened in the weeks before we had three and three units and then we had four units and this week because of how important this week is on just that specific unit and Kepler's laws and the work of Tycho Brahe and uh, Kepler and Galileo, we put them in one big unit by itself, okay? One week by itself. So let me go into, and there is a quiz by the way this week pre, uh, related to the previous uh, concepts. And don't forget that the discussion that is coming from today is going to go here. And uh, this is the activities that I told you, the short videos for, let me see if I can open that, for the different phases of Venus and how that can be interpreted from the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic model. But from the Copernican model, you will see that actually it's much, much easier to see the different phases, just like the moon phases, okay? And these are the three laws of Kepler with an emphasis on the third one. What I just described is the first law of Kepler up to this point. Okay, so let me stop sharing the screen and go with the objectives of today's unit. Let me put it first, let me make it big. And in doing so, let me find the share button in here and share it. And I need to pull the chat session in here. Where is the chat? Oh man, I lost it. Did I do something wrong in here? Okay. If you guys are going to say anything in the chat, I will have difficulty trying to find it, but that's fine. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> so these are the objectives. Do you guys see the objectives or not? Or should I stop share and share again? Because I was not sure of the process that I went through. Maybe I lost it. Share. 
Okay, now I have access to the chat all of a sudden. Okay, good. Okay, you guys see unit 12 learning objectives? Just we need one to confirm. Okay, thank you very much, Danielle. Okay, so basically we're supposed to identify the contributions of Tycho Brahe, Kepler, and Galileo to astronomy. I just basically made a big fuss of, uh, over what Mr. Tycho Brahe did, and he spent all of his life basically and all of his wealth, and he was a rich uh, person, I mean, to begin with, he, and uh, just to collect data, and that was valuable. Without his work, we would not be here probably sitting and talking about what happened before that, because it's based on his work that Mr. Kepler came up with three wonderful laws. If these laws again were not discovered by Kepler, then probably they would have been discovered later on by somebody else. But then the, that's how the sequence went. Okay. That's how the time basically, because he was hired, so it says by, uh, by Brahe to do the interpretation of those things. Okay. And he was protected. Even when he had him, he did not give him access to everything. As a matter of fact, until he passed away, that's when Kepler basically got the, all of the data and he started looking at it. And the first thing he concluded was the path of the planets is not circular because everybody had that idea that look, circles are perfection and the heavens are perfect. Therefore, the path of the uh, cannot be more than, than, than circles. Now, all of these shapes basically have to be perfect uh, circles. So then he looked at the data and it did not make sense to him because as you go around the, the ellipse, at some point you are close from the planet, from the sun, I'm sorry, that is called the perillion, okay? At some point you are very far from the, uh, I'm sorry, here is the star. The yellow is the star, always the yellow is the star in my presentation here. So at some point you're close from the yellow, and some point you are far from the yellow and as you go around the sun okay as you move closer around the sun the the planets speed up and as you move away from it the planet slows down okay and this is really the concept that came from the second law of kepler so the second law of kepler basically what it does is gives us and the rate with which the planet moves around the sun, how fast it moves. If it is close, it's going to move fast. If it is far, it's going to slow down and then fast and slow down like this, basically. Okay. Now, how much it is? Well, it turns out that the area, if I take a line from the sun and connect it to the star, it doesn't matter, uh, the planet, I'm sorry. If I have, this is the yellow, it's still the sun. If I take this point, it doesn't matter. That's what the planet is, that line, okay? If I take that line and connect it, that line, he said, sweeps equal areas at equal times, meaning it takes, because this distance is short, it's going to, to go fast on it to sweep this much area, to cover this entire area in one week, for example. I don't know. Let's take one week or one month, okay? Doesn't matter the time, as long as it's the same. So it's going to cover this area. But later on, it's moving slow, so it's going to cover this distance, but the areas are the same. Because you have a big radius in here over a small arc, whereas you have a small uh, radius with a bigger arc. Because you're moving fast in here, that's why you cover a bigger arc. So that was the second law of Kepler. So the second law of Kepler, take an imaginary line from the, the sun to the planet, and that line covers equal areas in equal amounts of time. It's wonderful stuff. I mean, so far, everything looks great. And he came up with the first two laws very quickly. It took him a long, long, long time. Overall, the entire work that it took him about 40 years, which is, I mean, comparatively speaking, I mean, it's a long time compared to what we do nowadays. But it's really, uh, at that time, he didn't have access to a lot of basically tools. But at the end, he came up with the third law. The third law is the following. It doesn't matter where I start from. Let's say, for example, from the perillion, when I'm very close from the star, around June, OK, June 21st, OK, from the sun, I'm sorry. And then go around the entire circle and come back to the same time. 
That is one year on Earth. From June 21st of this year to June 21st of next year, that is exactly one full year. Then the distance from here to here, which I call the, the semi-major axis, there is a simple relationship between them. Apparently, P squared is equal to E A cubed. This is P, the period. When I square that number, one squared is one, of course. Okay? Provided you measure it in years, don't measure it in seconds or because the unit of time usually is in, in seconds. Okay? But we're measuring it now in years. So one for the case of the Earth, when I square it, it's one. So one squared, one times one is one. The distance from the average distance from the, or the semi-major distance for the Earth, which is about the average of the astronomically, or the average distance from the Earth to the sun, because the, again, the eccentricity of the Earth is very, very low, meaning it's very close to a circle. So that case, because I'm exaggerating in this diagram, this is a very exaggerated distance for the two focal points for the Earth. They are, they are actually inside the sun, okay? So that distance is the astronomical unit to one AU. Cube that number, one times one times one is one. So what this second law is saying is that the period or the square of the period measured in years is the same as the cube of the distance measured in astronomical units. He did it by comparing those numbers for several objects for the uh, Venus, for Mars, and for Jupiter. And based on that, the ratio was always the same, does not change. He didn't know why, but that's basically what the laws were. So that is the third law of Kepler. So these are the three laws of Kepler. I just described the properties of ellipses and how they relate to planetary orbits. I already mentioned the fact that an ellipse has two focal points, has a, a major axis and a minor axis. Half of each is semi-major axis. Half of the other one is a semi-minor axis. The ellipse also has eccentricity which is basically an expression of how far the two focal points are, okay? All the planets orbit ellipses in their path, albeit some of them are very close from circular paths, but the circle is nothing but an exception for an ellipse. Circle is just an ellipse with zero eccentricity, that's all, okay? So that is the three Kepler laws I mentioned them. And now what Mr. Uh, Galileo did actually, because there was a lot of criticism for Kepler's laws and a lot of skeptics and things like that, albeit the data did not lie, the number did not lie. So things this should really be obvious for anybody who has training in any kind of uh, numbers, they should really see what they, uh, what they say. What Mr. Kepler did actually, because people, first of all, they did not really abandon the geocentric model because you can go out now, uh, tonight, and look at the sky and you would convince yourself that everything revolves around the earth. So how in the world are you telling me everything goes around the sun, including us? I mean, it's like a, it's another interpretation which I may not agree with my observation. I look at the sun and I see it going around the earth, okay? So there is no way. So in my belief, Jupiter and everybody else goes around the earth. So the earth is the center of everything. And we are here on a purpose because we are so special and our earth is special and everything is special about us. And that is the reason why everything revolves around us. That's actually a standpoint that lasted for thousands of years. So this is really a view that held for a long, long, long time. So here comes Copernicus sitting in his basically dark room with his candles looking at what we look at, including the retrograde motion of Mars. And he tells us, no, you guys have had it wrong. When you go outside and look at things going around the U, it's actually you going also around the sun and everybody's going around this. So that was the state of, the, of, of things 
during that time. So if Mr. Kepler and Mr. Galileo came up, there was a toy at that time. The telescope was a toy kids used to play with it, made up of lenses, basically. Two lenses, depending on their focal length. Okay, they can take an object very far away and bring it up close. Okay. All he did was turn it toward Jupiter. Look at Jupiter and see how Jupiter, how far Jupiter is, basically. Okay. To look at Jupiter, he was astonished the first night to three, see three moons clearly revolving around Jupiter. The next night when he looked at them, there was actually a fourth one. Four moons going around Jupiter. So here is the view that we held that everything must revolve around the Earth. And an example in front of our eyes where actually things go around something other than the Earth. Okay, we see clearly that these four moons are going around Jupiter, not around the Earth. So the idea that the uh, that everything must revolve around the Earth is not true anymore. So that was really a, 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 a something in support and evidence in support of the non-geocentric model that the Earth is not the center of everything. Here is an example. Look at Jupiter, four moons. Later on, they were named Io, the closest moon, Europa, the next one, Ganymede and Callisto. Those are the four moons. Nowadays, we refer to them as the Galilean system or the Galilean moons. They're big, they're not small. Io itself is big, much bigger than our moon. So all of these things are big. And probably Europa is small, but everything else is big. Okay. So this objects in here, they don't revolve around the earth. Okay. So that's one thing. The other thing also that he did when he looked at the moon, he saw that the moon, those what appears to be dark regions of the moon and uh, bright regions of the moon, they are nothing but valleys and mountains and uh, hills on the moon. It's clear from using a telescope when you look at the moon. And as the sun casts shadows in different areas, you can see everything in there clearly indicating that there is a moon, there is, there is mountains. So the idea that everything has to be perfectly circular and no perfections because the reason why it was given is because look, things are not as perfect on the earth because men sinned. Therefore, the earth has valleys and mountains and things like that. The earth is not perfect, not smooth. Whereas everything else in the heavens must be smooth and perfect. Here is another example that Mr. Galileo actually did also. He showed the moon is another example where that idea is nonsense. The moon actually has different valleys and different mountains just like the earth does. So now that is really the contribution actually of Mr. Galileo also to that in addition to now we have different, another problem that arose actually after that, and that is how can I take the period, for example, squared of, uh, of Ganymede, for example, and compare it to the period squared of Io, for example, and take the distance, because I didn't even know how to find the distance of Ganymede, for example, and versus that of uh, Io, and take those ratios, okay? There seems to be a connection, but that connection is not the same number as I gave with the third law of Kepler. Because for Kepler, if you take the period square, square. Or two, the cube of the uh, of the uh, of the semi-major axis, and that is true only for the planets as they revolve around the sun. But for other objects, it was a problem. We have to wait for the work of Mr. Newton almost uh, what, 40 years later before we understand why, where the third law is coming from. Okay, So this is basically the objective for today. So again, let me emphasize what the discussion of the item today is. Okay, Today, we are supposed to 
list all three laws of Kepler. We're going to say law number one, all planets are evolved around the sun in elliptical paths, or if you wish, the path, the path, not the path, the path of the planets as they go around the sun are ellipses. Okay, whichever way you want to put it. That's law number one. Make sense? Probably are taking note now. You can go to the book and actually find a better verbiage for it. Okay. The second law. This is the sun in my representation. First of all, what is an ellipse? An ellipse is this shape that has two focal points. It has a major axis, a minor axis, and it has an eccentricity, okay? And what is the eccentricity is basically how far these two focal points are. For most of the planets, these two focal points are very, very close from each other. They're actually sitting in the sun. So which means that the ellipse is very close from a circle, okay? But you're not supposed to write all of that. You're just supposed to tell me what the first law is. The first law says the planets, as they move around the sun, they go in ellipse of, in ellipses, elliptical paths, or uh, their paths are ellipses, whichever way you want to put it. So that's item one. Item two, as they go around the sun, and if I take this, the sun, and I take an imaginary number from the sun to the planets, that line sweeps equal areas with equal times. So the rate at which the planet moves is so that, or at least the speed with which it moves, is so that this area is constant from here to the planet, if the planet is here, or from here to the planet, if the planet is very far from the ellipse. Okay. So this is law number two. It has to do with the areas. The areas are swept at equal times, with equal amounts at equal times. Okay, again, refer to the book to see the exact verbiage of the second law. The third law it has to do with the time called the period to go once around the sun, which is a year for the case of the Earth, which is less than a year for Venus and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Venus and Mercury, but more than a year for anything else for all of the other planets, about a year and a half for uh, for. Uh, no, actually more, almost two years, 1.9 uh, years for the case of Mars, okay? And that is for the case of the, the other, uh, so you take the year and you square it, must be equal to the cube of the distance or the semi-major axis. So that is law number three. So we're gonna do an experiment a little bit with law number three now. Those, so do you guys understand what the assignment is, at least for those who are here? List the three laws of Kepler. Okay, thank you, Daniel. How about somebody else? Christian, very good. Okay, I have everybody now, at least most of the people who are here. Okay, so list the three laws of Kepler. That's the, your assignment today, okay? And the discussion, because yeah, that is really, a keystone of a lot of things that we're doing in this class. Okay, as I said before, there was an issue now. I mean, people were convinced based on the data, now Kepler's laws are solid. There is no question about it. And the earth is no longer the center of the solar system. And I mentioned before that this is really, really important because it led to major evolutions in physics, not just astronomy, but also in, in technology and the evolution basically of everything else. Let me expl explain the reason why I say this is a big deal. So if you happen to live in the 1600s, you know then that, 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 uh, that uh, you are sitting on a big change in technology, big change in the human thought, big change in basically in a lot of things that happen after that, including technology that we live today. There was a plague in London, the plague in London at that time, which is similar to basically the pandemic that we're going through right now, where everybody was sent home, go home, don't stay. You're going home now. Cannot have you here on campus because of the fact that there is a plague, similar to the conditions we're living in today. 
lasted for about two and a half years or three years where people were not allowed to go basically to do social distancing. That's basically what they did, okay? Uh, at that time, there was a student among them called Newton. So Mr. Newton, it was one of the people who was actually in school and he already came up with the three laws. And the three laws of mechanics have nothing to do with Kepler's laws. The three laws basically is that objects at rest stay at rest, objects in motion remain in motion, and uh, objects that uh, have... Uh, so basically there was the three laws of Kep uh, uh, Newton and the acceleration basically, the law of acceleration and the third law of objects interact, they, uh, there is an explanation of how they interact. So at that time, Mr. Newton was a student, dressed like you guys, okay? Although he came up with these three laws. And at that time, when he came up with them, the three laws of Kepler were well known, the one I just described, okay? So when the plague hit London, everybody was sent home and Newton also went to the countryside, just like everybody else, could not go to school. At that time, they did not have Zoom, so <laughs> we're talking about 1600s, okay, 1650s. Okay. So uh, <laughs> there was no, uh, no, 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 no internet, no nothing. So they could not hold classes then, but he was handed the work of Kepler. Here are the three laws of Kepler. Can you explain them? So he took his laws of mechanics and he took the work of Kepler and he derived an expression for the force of gravity. Number one, and he explained all the three laws of Kepler, namely the fact that the planets are going in elliptical paths, okay? That they sweep equal areas at equal times and that the square of the period is equal to the cube of the, uh, the, uh, the semi-major axis. Those are the three laws. So he came up with an explanation. The first one, the reason why they are actually he solved the equations, and when you solve them, you will find that the solution to 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 to, to the equation to the law of gravity are are not just elliptical paths, but all the conical shapes I mentioned in the beginning. So a planet can go in a circular path with an eccentricity of zero. This is an exception, and we have that exception in our daily lives. Those GPS systems actually they must have a, a very good close solutions to that, okay? Or at least they must satisfy the condition that their period must be 24 hours. So we use that solution. So it's not really an out of the realm possibility. As a matter of fact, it's even in Kepler's law, there was no exception. There, it's not out of the realm of possibility to have circular paths. The eccentricity would be practically zero of the ellipse. So circular paths, elliptical paths, okay? And then in the rare occasion, they could even have parabolic paths. Parabolic path is that the planet is ejected completely from the sun. And this could have happened in the beginning. As a matter of fact, so the, uh, the objects that come from outer, st outer stellar space, those are examples of solutions of parabolic equations, solutions to Newton's, uh, Newton's law of gravity. And those, they arrive from different ob from, uh, objects from different uh, stars, the same thing. Our star could have had those, in addition to hyperbolic solutions, which also are similar to the uh, parabolic solutions. They are ejected, they are not staying in there. So in other words, he came up with an explanation for the elliptical paths based on his universal law of gravity. And then he also explained with the conservation of angular momentum, the fact that they sweep equal areas at equal times. Not only that, but they also remain on the same plane for the same reason, angular momentum must be conserved. So the angular momentum is a vector. Since it's conserved, it has to stay in its direction, which means that all the planets, unless disturbed, they remain on the ecliptic plane. So that was really powerful stuff that Mr. Newton came up with and explained those things. Obviously, the, the equal areas is the quantity of the angular momentum, and the ecliptic is the direction of the angular momentum. So that nailed the second law of Kepler. This, both of them were beautiful solutions to, to that. Now, the third law is actually also as a consequence of the conservation of energy. 
just work out the algebra and you will see that the square of the period is equal to the cube of the semi-major axis if the period is measured in years and if the uh, the, uh, the the distance from the uh, planet to the sun is measured in astronomical units the ratio has to do with the mass of the sun so in a sense what you are measuring is how big the, how mass of the sun is because I mean, if all Mr. Newton did was explain the work of Kepler, this is not good enough in science. So that's why I was telling you how important the work of Kepler is and what happened after it. So what Mr. Newton did, he went a step further and he found that constant of proportionality, which now you can take a projected of the work of Mr. Galileo, or Galileo and find the mass of Jupiter. So now we can use those expressions to find the mass of anything. Not only that, there was a comet that came in and Mr. Haley took the work of, of course, Kepler with the, now the new interpretation based on Newton and predicted when that planet is going to, when that comet is going to visit the earth again. 76 years later, almost to the day, the planet showed up again, I mean, the comet showed up again. So, it is not good enough to explain things with a theory. You have to do go beyond the explanation. That is really what emerged from this, this thing. I'm just um, trying to emphasize how big these things are because of the fact there was an exception that was nagging to everybody. Mercury, no matter how much you do with the work of Newton and Kepler, there was an issue with its path. The path was not sitting on the same ecliptic. So what I was talking about in terms of conservation of angular momentum in terms of direction, why does it stay in the same plane? It wobbles in and out of the plane, number one. Number two, so that wobbling people start to, oh, maybe it's the effect of Jupiter, maybe the effect of Venus, maybe the effect of the Earth. They could not explain that. That's what really led to the revolution in the 20th century of Mr. Uh, Einstein what came up with actually the, uh, uh, the law of relativity, which really explains that. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is chapter 12 now, it's extremely important because it really, the reason why we're sitting in here with this much technology and with this much basically enjoy all of these things is what happened then and things evolved one after the other, after the other, after the other to where we are sitting right now talking about that. The human thought and knowledge was built on all of this work of all of these people. Copernicus, taking us from that geocentric model to a much better picture. Tycho Brahe with collecting all of those data. Again, let me go back into the, uh, share the screen with you guys so that you can see the objectives of today's uh, units. Tycho Brahe, again, with the wealth of data that he collected, which enabled Mr. Kepler to come up with these three laws, which later on, were confirmed at least in principle with the work of Mr. Galileo when he took the telescope and looked at those objects, which was later on uh, make, made uh, 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 more basically uh, clear with the work of Newton, although there was issues with the theory of Newton, that later on was explained better with, with the work of Einstein. And this is where we are now. This is where we are now. This week, you have only one unit and so again, for the few who came in late, you're supposed to list the three laws of Kepler, okay? You can look at the book, okay? Or you can look at anything in there. You can put them in your own words, but the thing is you need to be familiar with them, okay? Because of what will come la later on in this class. Let me stop sharing the screen and share with you page uh, 95. I'm looking, I think, at the sixth edition. It's the same thing from the fifth edition. It's Absolutely the same stuff, okay? So I'm gonna go, so the fifth edition or the sixth edition, and let me open the notes in here, and let me change my notes to astronomy and let me open a new page in here and let me call it week four. And let me share it with you guys, share. 
You need a calculator for this one, okay? But you don't need to do the math, okay? At this point, but we might need it down the road. So you need to know how to use the cube and the square on the calculator. What is my calculator? I don't have anything there. So you need a calculator to use the powers. The cube is basically multiplying number by itself three times. The square is just multiplying number by itself two times. So according to this table, if you look at the table, mercury It's semi-major axis. A is equal to 0 0.387 AU, astronomical units. Meaning I have to multiply this number by 150 million to find this in kilometers, but I don't care about kilometers. I leave it in AU. So I'm just going to have that. So what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to cube this number, A cubed, meaning I take 0 0.387 times 0 0.387 times 0 0.387. At this point, hopefully you guys have access to a calculator and you can do the same thing. Something to know, when you do math, when you do calculations, you have to know something about sig figs. This has three sig figs. So whatever I happen in here, I have to round either up or down to just three digits. I cannot really retain more than three digits. That would be a lie actually if you do that. So it's not honest to do that. So let me go into the, uh... in other words, you're claiming to have more accuracy than what you started with. You cannot do that, okay? So you have to, uh... so let me stop sharing and let me share with you the calculator that I use, which is Microsoft Mathematics. So I have 0 0.387 times 0 0.387 times 0 0.3 point, not uh, 0 0.387, okay? And the number I came up with is 0 0.05796. Zero six zero three. That is not correct. I have to only retain three digits, three sig figs. Okay, and the three sig figs are for sure 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and maybe the nine. But there is a six in here. I have to round up. In order for me to round up, I will make a six ten. So zero in here. These numbers are completely nonsense. They don't mean a thing. Because I started with three sig figs, I can only retain three sig figs. So the six is promoted to become uh, one. One and nine is 10. Uh, one and eight is, uh, one and seven is eight. So the correct answer for this one in here is A cubed is 0 0.0580. So let me share, you, share with you what I wrote for based on the calculator. So share this number. So this is A cubed expressed in astronomical units. Now, according to the book also, it gives me the P, the period <coughs> in years for Mercury. This is period or years. In other words, how long does it take to go around the sun once? It takes almost a quarter of a year, okay? Which is about three months, slightly less than three months, okay? So in one year, Mercury does four years in its cycle, in one year in here. So you could very be very, very old. So if you are 25 years old, now you're 100 years actually on Mercury. Okay, so that's the period. So the period according to this number is 0 0.241. Again, years. Okay, again, there are three sig figs. So if I'm gonna use the calculator, but I have to square it now, I cannot cube it. I have to just take this number and square this number. So. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share with you the calculator. So 0 0.241. I forgot the zero. It's a, it doesn't matter. Okay. It's the same thing. And I'm going to multiply it by itself according to this calculator twice. That's what the square means. So according to this calculator, 0 0.5801. 
So I'm not, I'm sure about the five and the eight, that's for sure, those are 100%. The zero is part of the rounding that is going to come from the eight. Eight has to be rounded up. So eight becomes a 10, and then everything else after that is neglected. So it's gonna be 0 0.581, zero. So let me stop sharing again. And I'm gonna share with you my notes if I can find the mouse. So again, the square is just multiply the number twice. I hopefully you guys have your calculator and you're doing these things. According to this calculator, it's 0 0.0581. Yes, there is this one different than the zero, but basically for 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 uh, for for uh, Mercury, p squared is very very close from a cubed. This is the third law of Kepler. Let's look at it at different. And again, I just mentioned the fact that uh, Mercury was an issue anyway. Mercury was a problem. Okay, let's look at different one. Let's look at Jupiter. Okay, it doesn't matter which one you're going to do. Let's take Jupiter. For Jupiter, the semi major axis A A is equal to. 5.20 AU. That means it's five times and slightly more further from the sun than the earth is. That's what that means, okay? If you are interested in kilometers, multiply this number by 150 million kilometers, and you'll find out how much, how, how far it is. But we don't care about that. We just leave it in AU. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take A and cube it. It, which means that I have to take 5.20 multiplied by 5.20 multiplied by 5.20. The reason why I wrote a zero in here is because also, again, the sig figs. There are three sig figs. So in other words, you cannot retain more than three and not less than three either. So it has to be exactly three at the end of the day. So let me sh stop sharing the screen in here and share with you the calculator and do the same thing. So I have 5.2, now here I don't care because I'm going to just multiply it by five, because if you do 5.20, it doesn't matter really, because it's a calculator. Calculators, that's why they give you nonsense numbers. They give you more or less than what they should. So in this case, it gave me 140.608. The 08 are for sure to be ignored because all I need is three sig figs. And the, three, the third sig fig, the zero, but followed by a 0.6. The 0.6 has to be promoted to a one, because it's more than 0.5. Anything more than 0.5 has to be promoted up. Anything less than 0.5 has to be basically ignored. So in this case, 0.6 has to be promoted up and the correct answer is exactly 141. So A cubed Are you guys looking at the uh, my notes or are you going to still looking at the calculator? I need somebody to tell me because I don't know what I shared. This is your um, this is your notes, Warren. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, very good. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Koba. Anyway, so a cubed, according to this calculator, is one hundred and forty-one. Okay. Again, I have exactly three sig figs as as much I started with. I need to do the same thing for the period p. For the period p, in other words, how long does it take for Jupiter to go once around the sun? It takes 11.86 years, almost 12 years. So if you are 24 years here on Earth, you are two years old on, on Jupiter. It goes very slow. Remember what we said about Kepler's laws? Because of the semi-major axis, really, the further the planet actually from the sun, the slower it goes, okay? I mean, the, the, it takes longer time to go because of this law. So it takes 11.86 years to go around the sun. Now, all I have to do is do P squared. According to Kepler's laws, which is 11.86 times 11.86. Now, all of a sudden I'm given four sig figs. So I can retain four sig figs, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing this 
and share with you. That means we know it more accurately than the others, that's all. Okay, so I have 11.86 times. By the way, this calculator does the star for times or space. That's why you saw me doing space earlier. Okay, 11.86. I have to keep four sig figs. So the six now is part of the sig figs. Okay, or at least one four zero is for sure. The six is questionable. Is it a six or a seven? That is really what the whole thing is. For that, I have to look to the next digit. And the next digit is a five. And a five and up has to be rounded up. So this is 140.7. And I have to retain four sig figs now, okay? But if I want to compare, I only compare with what I have. So let me share the notes again. So this number, according to my calculator, is 140.7. Okay. Again, if I want to compare now, I really have to round up because this has only three and this has four. So what this is saying then is that P squared also is equal to A cubed. So this is the third law and you can test it for any planet around the sun and you will find that this is true. That's a pattern that Mr. Kepler came up with. Okay. That is basically what Mr. Kepler came up with. This is the third law. So let me go back into my notes and write with my own words, depending on how you guys feel about it. Let me share with you the notes again. Okay, so the task today is the list, the three laws, and the three laws are the first law, Kepler. These are Kepler's laws. Okay, the first one is the planets orbit the sun, the sun, which is, which sits in one focal point. Uh, which one doesn't matter? Okay, which of the two doesn't matter? Okay, they are symmetrical. Okay, in elliptical paths. So the, th the th second law, the line, this is not real, okay? Imaginary, there is no real line, okay? The line connecting the planet to the sun sweeps equal areas at equal times. That is why the planet, when it's closer, when it's in its perillion, it, it experiences faster speeds than it's in its aphelion. It slows down when it's far away from the sun, okay? The third law, basically, this is the one that took them a long time to come up with. The square of the period of the planet in years, you have to express it in years, is equal to the cube of the semi-major axis. semi-major axis in AU, astronomical units. This can be written simply mathematically, this expression. P squared is the same as A cubed. So this is this week's basically stuff, okay? So hopefully you guys will join me. I know I promised Wednesday that Wednesday is not possible. I learned after the day after that Wednesday was not possible because normally I hold classes also live for the Monday section, sections. And there are three of them actually for astronomy and another one for physics. And I promised them way before because Monday was supposed to be a holiday that we could not meet. Since we cannot meet on Monday, we were to meet on uh, Wednesday. 
So after I talked to some of you guys and you wanted to do that extra session of Stellarium, I could not hold it uh, on Wednesday, but I am doing it on Thursday, knowing that some of you had problems with the Thursday because of some of you were working and have classes. But uh, I'm going to hold it because it's not required for you guys to attend it. So hopefully you guys will join us. And if not, you will watch it later on. OK, again, this is not required uh, meeting at all. So you can choose to skip the whole thing if you want to. But I would strongly recommend that you watch it later on if you cannot attend live or what came with uh, come with us because of the fact. Uh, that's fine, uh, John, uh, Jordan. Uh, so uh, we can uh, basically, uh, uh, for those who are struggling or don't have problems with Stellarium. So it's going to be dedicated on Stellarium completely, okay, from the get-go to the end, from its installation to its usage, to the shortcuts that are on the keyboard, to the alternative to the shortcuts in the keyboard mouse, especially for the web version, because if you don't have the installed version, you're going to need the, the mouse to use it for the web version, okay? So that's basically it for today. And hopefully you guys, I'll see you next week. I cannot be on campus tomorrow. And you know why? Because I'm having basically a substitution for the classes of Monday for tomorrow. Uh, Thursday also, I'm going to be uh, doing this with you guys. And I have another meeting later on also online. So I cannot be on campus. I'm not sure 100% for Friday, honestly. So probably Friday may be on campus. Okay, So depending. Okay, So uh, if not, and before I come in anyway, you're supposed to send me an email to tell me uh, that you're coming or you want to meet in person or we can do the meeting on, camp on uh, Zoom. Sounds good? Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.